talking about technology that, I don't know, 15 years old, maybe not even that, and talking about it in terms of being the traditional way of doing things, but it, it kind of is. And, and um, the traditional model of client-server scripting works like this. And we'll draw my famous diagram up here. How? You have a client, which is someone running a web browser connected to the internet. They make a request. Somehow it gets routed to the proper server and the server responds to it with an HTML document. Now again, we talked about in the case of simple static websites, the, the HTML documents are written and out there waiting to be delivered. Now, in the, in the, ju just in the interest of convenience, when I say an HTML document, I mean anything that can be an HTML document. That is, a com some combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So, just so I don't have to say that every time, um, I'll just call it an HTML document. So, in the case of static, those HTML documents are, are out there pre-written and simply get delivered to uh, the client. In the case of server-side scripting, The documents are not out there. Instead, scripts. And the analogy I gave, uh, you know, using the food analogy, is the recipes for web pages are out there. All right, the instructions to create a web page are out there. And again, uh, it's important to remember when you're writing PHP code, you're writing a program that's going to write a web page. All right, so you're not writing the web page, you're writing the program that's going to write the web page. All right, but the server does a little more work, but essentially the process is the same in the traditional model. The client requests something, it makes it to the server. Instead of plucking a pre-written static HTML page, the server processes a script written in any number of different languages, ASP.NET, PHP, Ruby, whatever, it processes those, processes the instructions, and the output that gets delivered to the client is still an HTML page. I will say, you know, a, a lot of times, um, and I made the suggestion uh, a number of times in lab, if, if you're ever wondering, like, uh, how to do something in PHP, first think of what the HTML needs to be outputted, all right, because if you know that, that can give you some, some guidance in how to create the PHP code to do it. And if something doesn't turn out the way that, that you expect it to, view the HTML source within the browser, and that will show you what actually got generated. All right, so those are useful tools as far as debugging goes. Now, where's the client side scripting come into? So the script is responsible on the server side in the traditional model. Server side the script writes a complete new page for every request. Where does JavaScript come in? JavaScript comes in for smaller sorts of things such as showing and hiding menus, showing and hiding big pictures when someone clicks on a thumbnail. So we're talking about making small changes to the web page without going through the cycle of requesting, going through the internet, requesting the server, and getting it back. So the purpose of JavaScript is to update an existing web page somehow. All right, and again, make things visible that used to be invisible, make things invisible that used to be visible, do a calculation and display the results, do a form validation and display error messages, any number of things, essentially we're doing the same thing. We're updating an existing web page without hitting the server again. 
And that's a key thing because that's really where the advantage of client-side scripting comes in is you don't take the time to make it back through the server. Now, you might ask yourself, if there's a time advantage with uh, client-side scripting, why not do everything client-side scripting then? Why even bother the server at all? Well, um, number one, there's always the catch that they could turn JavaScript off. That's one aspect of it. But even forgetting that for now, all right, there's resources for security and for feasibility reasons that the client can access that the server does have access to. For example, I drew in here, oftentimes server-side scripting interacts with a database. And therefore, your server code will connect to a database server and get data. Or it might connect to other sorts of, of objects or services or whatever. The bottom line is, is that the server has sort of the heavy resources. The server does a lot of the heavy lifting. And that's why for like providing data, um, it's going to be done, the server is what is typically thought of as providing data. Because it's the server that's going to hit up against the database and, 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 and do a search, for example, when we do a Google search. All right? Client couldn't do that, right? For, you know, we don't want the client to be able to connect to Google's database. It's probably not technical, technically feasible. Uh, but if it was, we still wouldn't do it. We still wouldn't want to do it, you know, for security and, and, and other issues. All right? But the client side can do sort of light things. Like, again, make a div appear, make a div disappear, that sort of thing. So this is a traditional model that we've been going at, you know, virtually since day one. All right? Now we're going to talk about Ajax. And when we do that, let's first look at an example of an Ajax application. And let's discuss how even if we didn't know about Ajax, even if we didn't know anything about Ajax, all right, we could guess that something's kind of funny, right? Something that doesn't fit this client server model is going on, all right? When we go to Google, all right? So let's go to Google, and let's start doing a search term, P. I type in P, I get a list of values. Now, what did we observe here? All right, what conclusions can we come to? It didn't reload the entire page, right? We didn't see anything flicker there. We didn't see the screen like, you know, like if I do a refresh, even though it's just very slight, you see a little bit of uh, it appearing and disappearing. We don't get any of that with this. Well, let, let's, yeah, let, let's go through this. Let's look at the evidence that we have here, and let's try to identify what's going on. So we know that JavaScript must be updating that, right? Because we're not going back to the server. At least not we're not going back to the server in the traditional manner. Right? Because remember, what does the, tra what does the server do in a traditional ma uh, a model? In a traditional model, the server writes a complete new page. So that ain't happening here. All right? So we can conclude reasonably that there's client side code at work to update that little square. But then let's think about it further. All right? How could we send to the client all the possible search terms that exist in the known universe or even Earth? All right, even if we take a subset of that and forget the known universe and just concentrate on Earth. We can't, right? This is one of them uh, heavy lifting sort of activities. This is hitting up against a database, obviously. If we remember back, when we did the mouse over menus, when we did this, 
I shouldn't have gone to that page. It's so sad thinking about Kim and her divorce. <laughs> All right. This page is obviously not behaving very well. Yeah. It's loading for an awful long time. Why do you think that is? Probably loading a lot of content. Perhaps content for this. Let's go to another. All right. Take two. I'll edit this out of the video. Oops. Yeah, there we go. All right. As we put our mouse over this, it's reasonable to say, well, look. There is, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's reasonable to say that we could send the HTML for those nine submenus with the main page, right? That's a limited number, uh, a limited amount of data. So we can understand how this is done purely, this piece of functionality is done purely client side. Because it's not that big of a deal to send a, you know, 10, submenus that are all invisible and as we put our mouse over them it goes in and changes that. So that's understandable but this our Google example anything I type in it gives me pretty quickly the data that I want. And even more than that, notice I type in AS and Ashland University is at the top of the list. Do you think the fact that we're an hour away from that has anything to do with it? Absolutely. Uh, all right. If we were performing this search somewhere else in the country, you know, if we were in New York and we did the search, chances are there'd be something else on the top of the list for AS. So it's pretty clear that something smart, there's some heavy resource work going on here. And yet, the page isn't refreshing completely. So this model goes out the window. I actually wish I could open the window. I'd, I'd make a paper airplane and throw it out the window to graphically show that this model goes out the window in this particular case. Now, is this model totally invalid? No. All right. There's still a lot of instances where this model works perfectly fine. Just like there's even some instances where static web pages work perfectly fine. To be sure, there's, more and more, there, there's less and less static pages and more and more dynamic pages. And there's more and more Ajax pages. But again, it's a matter of the right tool for the right job. All right? I'm not here to suggest that Ajax replaces this traditional model. It simply augments it. How does it augment it? It augments it in this way. By differentiating between two kinds of requests the client can make to the server. All right? The first kind of request the client can make for the server is an HTTP request, which if you notice, if you look up on your URL, HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com. What that means is that's a request that's being made using the HTTP uh, protocol. So HTTP requests are back to this business as usual model. All right? They're handled in the traditional manner. That is, the HTTP request will go to the server, the server does its thing and creates a web page. So even in the AJAX mode, some of the requests are HTTP requests and they get handled the same 
as in the traditional model where a complete web page gets sent back to the client. Now, however, there's another kind of request that's made. A request not for a complete page, but for a chunk of data. All right? Wish I had a different color. I'll try, I'll try using a pencil, see if that will work. And these are XML HTTP requests. These H, uh, XML HTTP requests, that, that's kind of a misnomer because, oh, uh, yeah, I'm fine. I already started that way. Um, it's kind of a misnomer because it doesn't necessarily always involve XML. It can involve XML, but it doesn't have to. All right. So the difference is, is these XML HTTP requests are requests for a chunk of data. as opposed to the HTTP request, which is the traditional model, which is an, a request for an entire web page. So what happens when the client makes an XML HTTP request? Well, that request still goes through the internet to the server, but instead of responding with a complete web page, it responds with a chunk of data. Now this chunk of data can be formatted any number of ways, including XML, which is how it got the name XML HTTP. But there's a lot of different ways that it could be formatted. All right, and we'll take a look at some of those. All right. So what happens with this chunk of data? Well, it's not like a complete web page, right? With a complete web page, all right, what happens? Well, the browser just displays a new web page, gets rid of the old web page and displays a new web page. With Ajax and getting back this chunk of data, what happens is instead of the browser we, instead of the browser writing a brand new web page, it sort of hands off that chunk of data to a piece of JavaScript. And that JavaScript does what it does well, namely updating a portion of the page. So it will update, it will rewrite a portion of the page. So, the key things to keep in mind with AJAX is that AJAX uh, involves two different kinds of requests. Um, the HTTP request, which is just a standard request like we've dealt with since the beginning of this course, a request for the, uh, to the server for a brand new web page. But there's another kind of request that a client can make, and that's an XML HTTP request. That is a request for a piece of data. All right? And that piece of data gets returned passed to JavaScript code, which then takes that piece of data, does what it needs to to update the form. So, in the case of our Google example here, let's say I navigate to Google. All right, I go in and I, I type in Google. That's an HTTP request, right? We, we can tell that just by looking at the URL, HTTP. All right, so we requested Google's home page. It snaked its way through the internet, made it to Google's web server. Google's web server returned, it back, returned back the, the, uh, the page and our browser displays it. So up to this point, we haven't done anything Ajaxy at all. All right, we've just done standard, traditional client-server scripting. At this point, 
I press a key. At that point, when I press the key, probably actually when I lift up the key, but we don't need to split that hair. All right. When I lift up the key, that request got sent to Google server again. But it wasn't an HTTP request. It was a XML HTTP request. So Google server takes that value just like our scripts take the values of the tuition, uh, uh, residency code, and number of hours. Google takes Google server takes that letter A, does its magic, finds the top X queries that start with A, and returns them in some format. Returns that piece of data in some format. That piece of data gets passed to a piece of JavaScript code. That piece of JavaScript code takes that chunk of data, however it's formatted, and updates the HTML of this page to include that. Every time I press a key, that process repeats itself. It takes a lot longer to describe than, than to actually do, right? And in that regard, I mean, that's amazing when you consider all those things that are going on here. You know, to be sure we have a, a good uh, internet connection here, and to be sure, um, you know, uh, Google, I'm, I'm sure, has, you know, you know, uh, the, the volume uh, on their server to, you know, they can handle a, a tremendous volume and, and so on. That's one of the reasons if you look at Google's code, if you did like a view source with this, it would be so ugly because they trim that down. You know, their concern isn't following web standards. Their concern is making for the smallest package to send back to the user. All right. So, that's in concept what we're doing here. All right. Now let's look at an example. And we'll look at a smaller example doing one of my absolute favorite activities, which anyone has had more than one class with me knows, and that is converting temperatures from centigrade to Fahrenheit. All right. So we'll do this Ajax-wise. Now, to be sure, is this something we need to do Ajax-wise? No, probably not, right? Um, this, but this is an example, right? We've got to walk before uh, we can run or crawl before we walk or however you want to put it. So therefore, uh, we're going to go over this example just so we can see how the pieces go together. Now, key thing to understand, as small as this example is, Ajax applications will fit this model. In other words, how do I want to put this? The model, even though this is very simple, has all the pieces of any AJAX application. There's just more involved everything in larger examples. There's more involved client-side scripting. There's more involved server-side scripting. There's more involved passing of data. But the basics of this, the, the sort of the, the template, the flow of this, will be consistent for really any AJAX application. So let's look at this. All right, and let's go in and if we enter the degree centigrade and we tab out of the field, it returns the degrees Fahrenheit and the degrees Kelvin. Now, if we notice that page doesn't flicker at all, all right, it's not re-requesting it, it's not doing a post back like you did in PHP, all right. And the functionality is built in, uh, on the web server. So we are making not an XML, uh, I'm sorry, not an HTTP request, but an XML HTTP request. Okay? So let's look at the code that does this. When we look at the code, we're going to consider the roles that the client and server has. Let's consider the general flow of this. The client is responsible for this. And some of these should make sense. First of all, the client is responsible for trapping the event that sort of gets the ball rolling, right? In my case, it was when I tabbed out of that field. That's what got the ball rolling. That's what kicked in the Ajax. 
in the case of Google, when I pressed the key, that's what got the ball rolling. All right? So the client side is responsible for that, which makes sense. Now, have we had, have we written client side code that traps events and does stuff with it? Of course we have. All right? That's one thing that's important to remember is that really Ajax isn't another language. Ajax is simply a different way of using the tools that we already know, the client side scripting and the server side scripting. So the client's responsible for trapping the event to get the ball rolling. The client is responsible for formatting the request and then making the request. And again, this will not be a HTTP request, it will be an XML HTTP request. So step one, trapping the event. Step two, formatting the request. What do you suppose I mean by formatting the request? Yeah, in other words, it prepares the data in the form that the server understands. For example, in this case, obviously, for the server to do its job, it needs the value in that text box. So the JavaScript is responsible, in this case, to take the value from the text box and include it in the request it makes to the server. Now, I ask again, have we pulled things out of text boxes in JavaScript? Of course we have. So again, we're going to do something different with them now, but that aspect of it remains the same from what we've done before. All right? Now, here's where the Ajaxy stuff works. Here's where the fun starts. All right? At this point, when the request is made, the client sort of just waits. I'll put that as number four, even though that's not a particularly, <laughs> uh, particularly difficult task. It sits there. All right. The server processes the request. All right. Okay. Process the request. What does that mean? Well. It takes the parameters that it gets passed, does something with them, all right, and returns the results. Now, have we written PHP code that does that? Yeah, we have. Your Mad Lib, the tuition calculation, all of them perform that function. It processed the request. Your Mad Lib took the words from the query string and did something with them. Your tuition calculation took the numbers from the form and did something with them. All right. Now we're going to take the, the in, in this case, in the, the temperature conversion, we're going to take that temperature and do something with it. And we're going to return the results. All right. So in this regard, that's no different than what we were, have been doing in PHP. Well, it's slightly different only from what we were doing. The difference being is guess what? We're not making a whole new web page. All right? Whereas in your Mad Lib, page A submitted to page B, right? And page B was a brand new web page. And your PHP code processed the data and outputted an entire web page. All the formatting, everything it outputted. So like if you wanted the words to be bold, it put the uh, appropriate tags or style associated with them. Your tuition calculation or our quiz, it took the input and produced some sort of output. Even with the post back, it was another request, it was a brand new page. All right. And we had to format it as such. We had to format and output all the stuff that we're going to make the page. In this case, the results 
isn't going to be a complete web page, it's just going to be some data. So, in the case of this example, it's not going to return a completed web page with HTML tags and head tags and body tags and, and divs and paragraphs and all that sort of stuff. It's going to return some raw data. All right. In this case, I don't remember the format I used to, but it might, it might uh, return simply tab delimited data or comma delimited data, which means that the server might just output, in this case, something like this, 212 comma 373, or maybe 212 tab. 373. Alright? So really, the server does a lot less work on an XML HTTP request than for a regular old HTTP request, right? Because the server doesn't do any formatting. Alright? The server simply, yeah, here's your data. Now, the client then, alright, the client is kicking back, grabbing a cup of coffee, all right, it's waiting for the answer. The client gets notified notified, yeah that's right, didn't look right, and gets delivered the data. So the client gets notified saying, hey, the server's done, and here's the data. All right. And what does the client do? The client does what it's good at, and that is it updates the page to reflect the data that got delivered. So in my case, in my example, the response that it got back from the server, all right, it went and it put in these positions on the page. In the case of Google, I start typing something in, the request is made, it gets back a list of things, and JavaScript updates the page to include the list of items that it got back from the server. So really, that's why if you look at like textbooks, one of the reasons I picked this textbook for this class is this is one of the few textbooks that actually uh, talks about JavaScript, PHP, and Ajax. Most other textbooks just talk about JavaScript and Ajax. Why? Because the server doesn't do a lot. All right? The server just actually does less here than in a traditional model because it doesn't have to do any of the formatting. It just spits out the data. If you think about it, that's more like the old school client server uh, model, pre-web, where the server represented a repository of data and the client program did the formatting and displaying and, and all that sort of stuff of it. All right, so let's look in the nuts and bolts of this. All right, let's go in here and let's start looking at the HTML page. All right, we're going to pop down to here and we're going to follow this, all right, and, and show where everything goes together, all right. First thing in our conversion is we tab out of the field. Boom. Whoops. Okay, boom, we tab out of the field. On that text box, we have on change convert temp this dot value. Okay? What does the on change event represent? When does that event get fired? Let me put it this way. This explains, by the way, why it wasn't working a second ago. 
the on-change event fires when we leave the text box and its value is different than when we came in. So, if I go and enter the text box and tab out of it, nothing happens, right? Because that value didn't change. I don't need to ask the server for an update because that value is already there. If, however, I put another value in and leave it, then it makes a request. So that's what the on change event says. It says, hey, if I've left the text box and the value is different, do this code. So that on change event is this. I'm trapping the event, all right, and I'm, I'm getting the ball rolling. And I'm calling a function called convert temp. And I'm passing it this dot value. I'm not sure we've ever used that sequence uh, uh, syntax before. This dot value. What do you suppose this dot value means? The value of the very element that I'm on. In other words, that piece of code is on this text box. Input type equals text. So if I say this dot value, I mean the value of that text box. I could do document get element by ID, blah, 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 give it an ID dot value, and that would work, right? But it's much more concise, and it's even a little more clear once you understand it, that this dot value means the value of this thing. And this thing is a text box. So I'm calling the function convert temp, Oops. And I'm giving it the value of this text box. So let's go up here and the convert temp function fires off. Let's rewind for a second. Because this convert temperature uses something called HTTP which is probably misnamed because this is actually an XML HTTP request, but we'll let it go. When this page loads, it creates a global variable called HTTP. How do I know that's a global variable? It's not declared in a function. What does that mean? It means I can use it in any of my scripts. All right. At least any of the scripts in the script tag. I don't remember if it's literally the entire page or just the script tag, but whatever. It's a global variable. What do you suppose that HTTP object is? What do you think it is? What's its role here? If you could describe it just in, in regular words, not technical words. Not really, no. No. Okay. no. HTTP, consider that to be the pipeline between the client and the server. All right, this is the communication line, the pipe, if you will, between the client and the server. So that's why you notice, and again, I apologize, I did this in a little bit of a, uh, uh, of, of, uh, uh, I should have probably talked about this first. That might have been what was a little confusing. But as soon as this page loads, it makes one of these pipeline objects, these request objects. All right? And it calls the function H, uh, uh, create request object. And whatever the request object, create request object function returns, it stores in HTTP. All right? Let's look at this get request object or create request object. This does what's called browser sniffing. It actually determines what browser you're running. All right. Um, those of you that I've discussed this with in the past knows that I'm not, knows that I'm not a big fan of browser sniffing. Um, this is one case where it's an absolute requirement. There's really no way around it. And the reason is, is the syntax to create a request object, that pipeline object, is different on Internet Explorer than it is in everywhere else in the world. 
all right, Mozilla browsers, Google Chrome, Safari, Opera, whatever. All right. And if your browser, which we can grab from the navigator object, the navigator is the is a DOM object that tells you a little bit about the environment that you're in. One of the attributes of that object is the app name. We can look to see if that browser, the app name for the browser is Microsoft Internet Explorer. If it is, we create our request object this way. This is the proper line for creating a request object using Microsoft Internet Explorer. Otherwise, we create our request object this way. All right. Take, pardon me. Uh, on this here, is there actually two variables there? The first one being HTTP and then the next one being RL. It's two different things there that are creating the request object. Is acting on. One is acting on HTTP, the other is. Well, all right. Let's follow this through. Let's see how those two work together. HTTP is my global variable. All right. I get that object. I get my instance of that object by calling this create request object function. Inside that request or create request object function, I have some code that creates an object called RO and that's what gets returned and that's ultimately what gets put in HTTP. So RO gets returned from this function and that becomes HTTP. All right. Is RO um, choice a variable or is that? Yeah, it's just a variable name. Yeah, it just is shorthand for request object. Now, the point to remember about this is we look to see what browser we have and we create that request object one of two ways. When we're done, however we've created it, whichever path we follow, we return it. So that request object gets returned and gets stored in this variable. So now HTTP contains our request object, which is our connection between the client and the server. All right. I'm going to go a little long today because we didn't get started uh, right on time. All right. I, I probably only have about five minutes to wrap up this, at least uh, to, to get through the, the whole uh, pass at least one time. So the bottom line is after this page loads, I have an object called HTTP that represents my pipeline. All right. Again, try to understand this code, but if you don't understand it immediately, just know that after I execute this line and call this function, I have my pipeline object. Okay. Now, back to this. I press my key, or I'm sorry, I press my tab to go out. I've changed the value. So I call convert temperature and I pass the value to that function. What does convert temperature do? Convert temperature is responsible for these two activities. Is responsible for formatting the request and is responsible for making the request. These first two lines are formatting the request. The last line is actually making the request. Now, let's see how it's formatting the request. Get. Where have we seen get before? In the action of a form, right? The other way that we can make, uh, uh, and other way that we can make a request for the server. So. We're saying get here, that means what? That means we're going to pass the values on the query string. What are we calling? We're calling convert PHP, 
That's the name of my server side script. Convert PHP. And we're adding on to the query string temp equals and we're concatenating the argument to this function. Now what's the argument to this function? The value of the text box. So what we're making is we're making the request convert.php question mark temp equals and then whatever the value of the text box is. All right. Now here is what in my mind is the trickiest part of Ajax. On ready state change. All right. Remember we said that Ajax waits and then it gets notified. This is sort of setting up sort of like the return address of this request. All right. Think of this, uh, think of this request as being like giving a voicemail message to the server. Hey, can you send me that data? All right. The A in AJAX stands for asynchronous, right? What does that mean? It means it's not necessarily synchronized, right? It's not necessarily at the same time. Voicemail is asynchronous, right? You call me and leave me a voicemail uh, tonight at 9 o'clock and say, uh, when is that lab due? All right? I'm not going to be here at 10 o'clock, so when I get there in the morning, I pick it up and I call you and say it's due on blah 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 whatever the date is. Now when you called me you probably said uh, hey this is so and so uh, when is the assignment due give me a call at 440 whatever whatever whatever. You gave me your callback number. All right. Think of this as setting the callback number. All right. Except your browser doesn't have a phone. All right. Your phone has a browser, right? But your browser doesn't have a phone. So it's not going to give a phone number. What do you suppose it's going to give instead? It's going to give the name of a function. All right? This handle response is the name of this function. So we say what script we want to call on the, uh, on the server side. We say, hey, by the way, server, or actually, by the way, connection object, when the server's done doing its thing, tell this function. Give the response to this function. And then finally, this line of code actually makes a request. So we've said, hey, Call convert PHP and give on the query string something called temp that has a value of whatever value is in our text box. When you're done, notify this function. Okay? And then go ahead and make the request. At this point, we are at this step of the process. Step four. Let me renumber these to put them in their proper order. We're at step four. The client is waiting and the server gets to do its thing. The server code is so simple it's not even funny. All right. If we look at the server code for this, server code grabs temp from the query string. Why is that equal to temp? Well, because that's what we called it on the query string when we formatted our request. Um, when I asked the question, why does the client need to be uh, format the request, the answer came back to me, it needs to make the request in the form that the server's going to understand. Well, the server's expecting an, a, a thing on the query string called temp. All right? It's, it's expecting a thing on the query string called temp. All right? So that's what we give it when we make the request. This grabs the value from that query string and does a couple of calculations for um, what is this? Fahrenheit and Kelvin. And then it prints. But notice what it prints. It just prints the two variables separated by a comma. In this particular instance, it's return, returning comma delimited data.
So this is what the server is returning. That's it. No formatting, no nothing. Just the data. All right? That's why I said most books that cover AJAX really focus on the client side, right? Because the server side's job was real easy. All right? It processed the request and returned the results. You know, that took a minute to talk about, right? It's just regular PHP. The only difference is the output isn't going to be a complete web page. The output is just going to be a chunk of data. Now, the last step here is what happens on the browser after the server responds. And what happens on the browser after the server responds is, remember, that handle response function gets called. Now, that handle response function gets called every time the status of the request gets updated. All right? So I guess the, the voicemail analogy is a little bit off, right? Um, it would sort of be like if you called me, left me a voicemail message, and asked me a tough question, I might call you back the next day and say, look, I got your question, I need to do some research and I'll get back to you. And then I might call you back saying, okay, I'm working on it now, I'm Googling, I sent my request to so-and-so, and I should have the answer. And then I might call you up and say, hey, here's your answer. Right? I might give you status updates if you call me with a, with a, with a tough question. All right? Same thing happens here. This handle response gets called several times through the process because on ready state change, what that means is every time the status change, this function gets called. And again, the statuses I don't remember off the top of my head. There's something like I sent the request, the server got the request and is working on it, the server has the answer and it's about to send it to you, then finally here's your answer. The status we're interested in is a status of four. Status of four means the server is done. All right, so when that status of four is reached, that means that the server has finished its processing, all right, and the data is now available for the client to do something with. So when the status hits four, we're at this step. The data gets delivered, and we can work on updating the page. Now, let's look at this particular update. What this is doing is the data gets sent back to the client in that variable. Remember, we could have guessed it was part of that HTTP object, right? Because we've defined that HTTP object as the pipeline. So it only makes sense that the status of our request and the result of our request, the response to our request, is part of that object. And in this particular case, it's in a variable that's called response text. All right? I'm calling the split function. What the split function does is it takes comma delimited or, or any other delimited data and splits it into an array. So in our case, the split function, what it does is it takes this data and makes this array element result 0, this element result sub 1. All right? Then, now we have an array that has our two answers, the Fahrenheit temperature and the Kelvin temperature. What do we do with that? Well, we do what we've been doing with JavaScript all along. We change the body of the page to reflect that answer. So, we find the div that's called results, set its inner HTML to result sub zero. We find the div whose ID is result two and set its inner HTML to result one. Now, I know this is a lot for one class, 
All right. We'll definitely review this on Monday and we'll go over examples and we'll talk about this. And we'll do a little bit, a little bit of debugging too. Because one of the things that's tough about debugging Ajax is when you run it, you don't get any results. It's hard to tell what's wrong, right? You know, the client side code points at PHP and says it's PHP's fault. PHP points at the client and says, no, it's its fault, right? You know, just like if you're building the house, the plumber says it's the electrician's fault, the electrician says it's the plumber's fault, right? It's your job to figure out. And there's some specific things that you can do to make sure everyone's doing their job. The one thing I really want you to do is, again, look at this code and look at the, the, this code from this perspective of doing these activities. And even if you don't understand all the syntax of all the instructions, try to understand or even take this code and comment it that will match up the functions that are being performed, you know, the, the, the piece of the puzzle that's being addressed by the piece of code and the specific statements in here. And then we'll go over the syntax more. All right. The one thing I think you can see from this is, with the exception of, a, you know, making that HTTP object, this is sort of the kind of stuff that we've been doing all along. We've been pulling data from text boxes and doing something with it. We've been taking data and outputting it to our page. We've been writing PHP scripts that takes the data, does something with it, and returns the result. Really, the only new component with AJAX is that H uh, XML HTTP object, which, again, is our line of communication, is our pipeline between the client and server. All right, so um, that's it for today. We'll see you in lab. I apologize for going over, but um, we'll see you over in lab.